Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Alexander Schwartz. I'm part of the Tech Transfer Office of IST, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Twist Talk. Uh, for those of you who have not attended the Twist Talk yet, uh, let's give, uh, give, I want to give you a few words of introduction of what uh, Twist Talks are about. Um, as you certainly know, IST Austria is a research institute that really aims to conduct top uh, basic research uh, and science. On the other hand, we also have the commitment to actually transferring the knowledge that is created at the institute into the world of business um, in, the, in the form of startups um, or in, in the way that we outlicense technology to companies. And as part of uh, the activities of the tra Tech Transfer Office, we also hold uh, those so-called twist talks. And in this series of twist talks, we uh, present people with unconventional careers that use of people that usually come out of science, but then took an unconventional, unexpected twist um, and used their science skills for something quite different um, with the aim to actually inspire scientists to try something different, to remind them that actually technology transfer is important, can be fun and also quite value creating. Um, our today's speaker is Kurt Bilby from Texas and we used the opportunity of a virtual talk to actually invite somebody who is not here locally, but is actually joining us from Texas. So welcome Kurt. Um, and he's going to speak about technology commercialization, an unconventional path for unconventional people. And as you will see, Kurt is just the right person to do so and speak about that. He is an engineer by training. He holds a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and then he started with something that looks more or less conventional at the first glance. He started uh, by working and leading uh, companies in the field of biotechnology, sensors, um, diagnostics, cancer, but then took another turn away from science or maybe, but still using science uh, in the sense that he is president and CEO of uh, Art Analysis and Research, a company that applies uh, a series of tools from, from science to actually learn more about artwork. So he's going to tell us a lot today about his life and his experience, <laughs> how to apply science for different things. And I'd like to thank him for being here today. But before I actually hand over the word to him, uh, a few words about housekeeping. Uh, we do this in today the following way. We first have uh, the, the um, talk of, of Kurt, uh, the participants, you all, um, can uh, post questions as we go uh, via the Q&A button at the, the, the bottom of the screen. You send them to me and I will post them to and ask them to, to court in a, in a structured way so we have a good discussion afterwards. And maybe if time allows, we can have also an open discussion at the end. So without further ado, uh, Kurt, thanks for joining us today and the screen is yours. Thank you, Alex. Although I wish I was there, uh, I very much, I think, like enjoy strolling through the vineyards and maybe cycling a bit, uh, as I think it was uh, 37, 38 here yesterday. So we're enjoying air conditioning uh, now. So You're heating right now. <laughs> so, yes. Um, so today I'm, I'm really focusing talks the kind of discussion to those that are in obviously the technical field, but looking to launch a company themselves, focus their research to launch a company, uh, join a company, join a startup, but really the actual technology commercialization process will lead to, to some others. There's a lot of written up, but we'll really try to address some of the experiences you may have on this path, what you can prepare for, what you might want to do, but it's really just to allow you to ask yourself some questions as you start on this, embark on this uh, process. But uh, I'm assuming most of 
you or y'all, as we would say in here in Texas, have a science and engineering background. And then by definition, there's all kinds of problems we can solve. And there's very few problems we can't solve, maybe quantum entanglement or something like that. But um, we certainly have confidence that we can solve a lot of problems. However, I'm gonna start with maybe a way we view solving problems that may be a little bit different in the technology commercialization path. It's a pretty simple example. It's a US comic strip, Calvin and Hobbes. So it's, it's gonna be something simple uh, to start with. This comic strip is about a little boy who has a stuffed tiger, tiger and it comes to life. And here's his view on entrepreneurship or strategic marketing. And we see Calvin, the little boy who has uh, a little stand where he's selling, has a problem. And it is one of the key problems that I've observed from the technology side and a lot of times moving to the business or marketing side. And I think it shows up right there in the last frame where the little boy is selling what he thinks people need. He's determined what they've needed and not what they want, but what they need. And a lot of times that's where we come from a technology perspective is we're determining what people should have, what we think they need, rather than determining what they want to buy, what solves their problem. And that's gonna be kind of the crux of a lot of the things we're talking about um, today, um, that difference between what somebody wants and what somebody needs, um, because that's really at the cornerstone of technology commercialization, especially at a basic research institute, where you're looking to advance the field. And a lot of times you're focused on that technology field, the scientific field, and you're advancing that with no specific focus on the market. So then the cornerstone then I'm talking about in technology commercialization is we have a solution, but what problem does it solve? And that tends to be the big hurdle that you're, you're looking to do in technology commercialization. But before I kind of jump into that, I wanted to kind of take a step back and say what I believe is going to be critical to your careers and your successes, especially since most of us came from a very focused background in certain topics that were very deep in certain areas and been really focused on advancing the fields of science. What made a difference to me in my career was a person who plucked me out of when I was a graduate student, a guy named George Kosmetsky. Um, he was a wonderful mentor. It was in, uh, interesting how I started with him. I, he asked me if I wanted to work on something and I said yes and I started working and, but I wasn't getting paid. So I show up at the secretary's office who was a very strong gatekeeper asking for my paycheck and she said, you heard, I, she heard nothing about it. So I went to talk to this billionaire <laughs> asking why I wasn't getting paid. And he said, well, you never asked to. He said, would you like to sit down and let's talk, draw up an employment contract? So that was my introduction to human resources and employment contracts. Um, we then started launching a business. This was really in working in NASA advanced programs. It was fun. You would go home, watch Star Trek on television get a few ideas, come back to, to work. So it was, it was fun. But when you do that, you have to have an accounting system because you're doing work for the US government. Well, I researched and found an accounting system that we should buy and he wouldn't buy it. He made me set up the accounts on ledger paper. Oh, I was so mad but he taught me accounting. I learned project accounting, balance sheets, income statements, cash flow. I didn't know I was being 
mentored at the time or trained, but that was how he did it. We launched our first company. I launched it with him. Uh, we just happened to be um, working with the former secretary of the Air Force who said the Air Force was gonna commit to GPS. And so Dr. Kosmetsky said, well, you should, we'll hear from Kurt the next board meeting, a business plan on using GPS. What? I mean, now, of course, you would love it. You know, entrepreneurship is Im embedded in our culture. But then I just thought I might get terminated or fired if I didn't have a business plan. And I came up with a business plan, our, our team did, and it needed $3 million. And he said, go get a contract from someone and I'll finance you. That was his way of doing market research. So he was very instrumental in putting me on a path this way. Um, without that, I probably would have followed a conventional academic pathway. Um, I was on a NASA fellowship working with NASA. So that was very influential on how I started down the road of using technology developed elsewhere where basic research was done elsewhere, applying that technology to solve a business problem. Their GPS, well, the, the system wasn't even fully developed where you didn't have cell phones, we we're using radios, we we're building our own maps. But in the end, GPS was not the cornerstone. We went into telecommunications area, solving a workforce management productivity issue. That's what they wanted, how to reduce their cost and be poor productive. They didn't want to track their vehicles. But so that's when I was on the wrong side. I had a solution. We went out trying to sell. They said they weren't interested, but could you do this? So then we kind of got on the right side of the fence to develop something that they wanted, not something we thought they needed. Um, so I guess one of the questions that some of you are postdocs looking to, to move it to the next point, whether it's a startup starting your own, some folks are probably maybe professors kind of saying, hey, my technology can be the cornerstone or foundation of a startup. Some of you are completing a PhD or other program and saying, hey, I'm gonna take my work out. I would say to do that successfully, you're going to probably need to expand your horizon where you've been embedded in your research program. And that usually comes with proactively seeking out mentors and also being a mentor. Um, and <laughs> you say, well, how can I be a mentor? Well, you have a lot to offer for sure. But a couple examples from me, one of the guys I ride a bike with, when we started riding a bike, he was a vice president. And we would talk and he would just keep asking questions and questions and questions. That same person who's now a CEO, I was asking him questions on this morning's bike ride. I was asking about clean data sets and how you're applying AI rules to those clean data sets. How did he get the clean data set where with the data he started? So he's actually kind of reversed and helped me. Uh, we had a leader of a company. She was um, a wonderful subject matter expert, uh, one of the top people in her field, really knew nothing about contracts, really knew nothing about uh, finance, accounting, but she has become a sponge. And when I'm dealing with some tough problems, I'm calling her for her perspective. So where I started out being more of an instructor, I don't know if it was a mentor, she's now the person helping me. So I would say if you start helping somebody as they evolve, they're gonna have different experiences and that relationship's really gonna help. And I just kind of put four different perspectives there of that can help you, but be proactive. Don't just let it happen. 
Um, some people may not have time. Most people who would be, <laughs> you know, uh, somebody who could contribute to your career, your company are going to be busy. But I think you'd want to be persistent uh, in asking, uh, or at least um, have a compelling story of why it'd be worth their while. So I think that's a key as you, you're thinking about maybe doing a technology commercialization play, a licensing play, to say that's going to be a critical part of that. And you know, we could talk about board manage board, how you do um, board or director structuring and things like that. But this, I would say you want to, if you're earlier embarking on this, make sure you get other advice from different perspectives. So, all right, sorry for the long preamble, <laughs> which it was, so I apologize. Um, so, technolo first, technology transfer, as you probably know, is different than technology commercialization. Technology transfer is kind of getting it out of the university into the company, and then once it's in the company, you commercialize it, getting it out into the world. A lot of technology commercialization kind of falls down in the technology transfer process. But all this is well known, so let's not talk about that, okay? There's lots of papers on tra transfers, conferences on commercialization. There's all kinds of resources that you can help uh, or that you can access to, to do that. So let, let's leave that to some other resources. Um, so maybe we should actually talk about launching a business. You know, what's your marketing strategy? What's your business model? How are you going to scale the company? What's your value proposition? All of that, what's the back office accounting system? All that type of stuff that's very important and key and critical. And there's even a book <laughs> a series of books for dummies for it. So there's all kinds of resources. So let's not dive into that because there's all kinds of stuff. Let's talk about more soft science. <laughs> um, really communications. And this is communicating with prospective customers, the market, communicating with your team, communicating with the developers of the technology. Um, because that's not so easy when you're mate, when you're spinning something out of the university, getting um, everybody on the same page, plugging the university technology into the market. And maybe something you really don't talk about a lot in, I would say it's in tech commercialization, but empathy. And when I say empathy is, is oh, feelings and strong emotions, it's really putting yourself in the shoes of the other people because, because we have been so focused on basic research and that, that the rest of the system we haven't listened to or paid attention to. So when we're actually listening to somebody from a different perspective, instead of trying to show our view about the technology, can we really kind of say, why are they saying this? what's so important to them, figure out what's motivating them. So I think with these two tools, if you go back through the commercialization process that I kind of referred to, you talk about your business planning, you'll have those skill sets, you've got a wonderful technology, but don't forget the soft science here. Um, and I think that's um, important because there's different, currencies, different metrics um, that I've seen come up time and time again in meetings, come up with frustrations of people talking to each other. Because you're in a university setting, you are contributing things that are unique to the field, whether they have commercial value or not. Um, okay, that's something new that society is bringing into academia, you actually getting credit for it having some commercial or societal impact. Here in academia, we have want to push the boundaries. We're after discovery. And with that discovery and new things, we focus on publications and presentations to conference because this is how the field advances with this academic research. And we're recognized for that. Um, Humboldt Foundation and other wonderful 
um, places uh, bestow honors on good work. And I think that's key to advancing the field. However, if you're in a business meeting, <laughs> that unique contribution to the field isn't necessarily a metric. That's not how you're valued or measured. Um, there are business metrics there. And how you translate to understand those business metrics, to understand why they're talking about that, will help your voice be heard. If you're talking about something is so important because it's so unique to the field, that's not going to necessarily carry the day. Because in academia, it's your contributions to the field, so you're talking about what you're doing for the field. In business, it's what benefit you're delivering to the customer. So it's then empathy about what the customer really wants, why they want it, and then how your technology solves that. So it's just a different metric that I would suggest you think about how, why this person is acting this way from a business perspective and what's so important because a lot of times we just have a hard time making that translation and I've, I've, I've just observed it and I've been part of it <laughs> and I'm not, I'm hoping you're probably smarter farther down the road than what I ever was and have observed, but I think that is something from an empathy perspective that will, should serve you well. So let's say you've launched your company, you've transferred the technology, you've got a wonderful team, you're getting ready to, to either move it to the market or you're going to, uh, as in most cases, need to seek financing. And if you're gonna seek financing, investors, whether that comes from the university fund coming out to, to help, whether it's coming from angel investors, whether it's coming from venture capital, most likely not private equity at this point, you've got to talk about creating value because somebody's going to be giving you some funds, cash, and they're gonna get more back. And how do you see value being created? How are you communicating value being created? Most of us think in a linear fashion. Um, think, okay, here we got to do the prototype. We've got to then do version one, then version two, very linearly on a development program, a series of experiments. We've got to do this data set and get this data. Then we'll do this very linearly um, to that. I hope everybody knows about a Gantt chart and deadlines. If you don't, I would write it off to the side. Gantt charts, milestones, deadlines, is that's gonna come up in business meetings all the time. But if you're in a technology commercialization play, you're gonna be raising money and probably the first amount of money isn't going to get you to positive cash flow because cash is king in a startup. So when you're talking to the investor, he's thinking something like this. He's not thinking a linear pathway. Okay, he's not looking at your technology program. You may look at the, the commercial, the marketing program, how it's doing in revenue, but they're gonna be thinking about this. How is, do we increase value to where we are at a point of scalable growth and positive cash flow? So how that's normally viewed is a series of step functions. That's not a linear pathway. And why is this important is that a lot of times we see a linear pathway that, well, once we get to the point, I don't know, uh, six, we'll get more money and then we can start seven, eight, nine. Well, the investors looking at well, how far along the pathway do you get to when there's a valuation jump? And that valuation jump usually comes not with necessarily straightforward and linear accomplishments. It comes from de-risking several areas of the business. And that 
is one of, it's consumed a lot of discussions, the technical team, why are we stopping at step three when we should be going on to four or five? Well, step three got us a step up in valuation. We've got to then test that in the market, bring it back, and then we can raise more money to get further along to get through steps four through eight, let's say, <laughs> along the pathway, uh, rather than running out of money. So this paradigm of a development plan seeking around valuation is a different paradigm that I think is, you want to engage mentors and talk about this. Um, and it's not always so straightforward as this. Somebody's going to be talking about the scalable business model. How does it grow? And you're going to say, but this is wonderful. That, that's easy. The technology, we've got to get it developed. Well, the business model and de-risking that is going to be just as important. So anyway, that's just a, a little bit of uh, an, an example of where I've seen some consternation, some tension, that it just is a difference between a linear development plan and how you create value in a startup to raise cash and the amount of funds you need to carry on to get you to positive cash flow. So it's usually a different paradigm. And it doesn't make sense always from a technical scientific engineering perspective, but that tends to be how the company is probably going to be run. Um, so you've got your development plan. You've got your how you're going to increase uh, your, your value and things like that. You've raised your first rounds of money or you're still looking for that. And it's all based on your forecast, okay? You're forecasting your development plan. You're forecasting your marketing plan. Then you say, okay, I've got to take a guess at sales. And then you have your forecast in a technology plan and a income statement, okay? That's typically what we take to the investment community. They've got a lot of work to do after that. And that's where I think you want to do that as part of your business plan is the box there pro forma. Look at how much more money is going to be needed to be raised after this first round or after this second round. How much money are you going to have to raise to get to positive cash flow? Because the investors are going to model that. Certainly a venture group or a private equity is going to model the number of rounds that's needed to get to positive cash flow. So you might as well, and you might as well just tell them that you've got enough knowledge and experience that you say, okay, 750,000 is gonna get me to this. Great, and that's going to increase my value so we can go out and raise another 1.5 million to then take us to the next step and our last go to market is 2 million. That's great they're they're going to be saying that's a wonderful way that you, you're doing it you're breaking it down they then may get uh, into discussions hey if we give you more can you accelerate it oh those are wonderful conversations to have um but that's usually pretty easy but the one thing in the pro forma the actual uh, looking at specific transactions and the impact I would say you want to forecast and do a pro forma of your ownership table, of your capitalization table, because that's usually a big rub on how much somebody owns and whether they have controlling shares and things like that. And I would say, because if you model your cap table saying I'm going to give take on 750,000 and give away 30% of the company, then I'm going to take on $2 million and give away, uh, let's say 25%, whatever you think the valuation model is, look at the ownership structure at each point. Now, most of the capitalization tables that I've seen 
where you model it out in the future is all about percentage. And if you're the founder, you're the inventor, your percentage is always gonna go down. Okay, so that means everything's bad in the future. I would say you want to look at this, the pro forma cap table, ownership table, about your value. Because if you're taking money from somebody, you're saying our objective is to increase the value for our shareholders. That's the objective of the company. And you should be able to see your holdings increase in value. Your percentage is gonna go down. So why look at that? Look at, is that percentage going down, but is your value going up? And that changes a perspective and looking at it so greatly. It's uh, by changing that, I've done that a few times, it just changes the whole emotion of the discussion. So I would say, look at what you think the ownership structure is gonna get. And then once you do that future ownership structure, you're then seeing what you're working for. There's the, you know, the, whatever, the golden ring, let's say at the end, um, that's the kind of reward. Now, hopefully we get reward along the way because this is a whole lot of fun. But when you're talking about the objective of taking an investment and providing a return, that's the answer. And in regard to exit, I would say you want to do more work on the exit because that's how the invest, why the investor is giving you money is to get more back. And that comes through an exit. Okay, it could be um, you float or do an IPO. Well, that's always hard to imagine. So you usually kind of throw that away. Oh, are you going to do stock buyback? Well, then you, the company's got to be a big cash flow, cash cow. Sometimes that's not so easy with tech commercialization plays. Same with the dividend model. Um, so you usually look at mergers and acquisitions. Can I sell to someone? Spend time looking at who might buy you and why that you would be of value. That's where the venture people are going and the, the private equity are really going to talk about or look inside, that's where they're gonna do their analysis. And if you've looked at that and can make a compelling argument, that's gonna hold up your valuation much more than probably a lot of your details of your technology development plan and how robust that is. That's just kind of given that you're gonna have a good development plan, but you have a good exit strategy. So those are two, pro forma, capitalization or ownership table and a lot of research on the exit environment market who might buy you okay you don't have time i you're already busy <laughs> and i've kind of said oh find some mentors be a mentor what okay oh and now i'm supposed to not look at a linear development plan i'm looking at increases in valuation holy cow now you're wanting me to look at a capitalization table and exit, and now you're wanting me to do um, exit, M&A. So you've given me a bunch of other time, I don't have time. So those that have been around me for quite a while have seen, have heard me say, use the term 40, 20, 10. Well, um, I've kind of changed that. I just changed it here at this talk, really um, kind of in honor of my uh, father, who passed away, died um, last month, who really was the first person to help me go down the science path. He was a farmer and he helped me look at an experiment with fertilizer. 15, 30, 15, that was the fertilizer. And we, he helped me with the science project. So I've kind of changed the paradigm that people are getting sick of. Uh, hear me hearing to instead of 40, 20, 10, 15, 30, 15, because you know, you have a limitation of what you can do in any one day. But there's more things on your plate or more things on your list than you can accomplish. But these are usually all good things. Well, also there's people out there conspiring to give you their work or ask you to do more. So 
you're going to end up with a lot more things to do than what needs to be done. That's just the environment of a startup, environment of a tech commercialization play. And what makes the difference is the decisions you make and the decision your team make. And you don't want to micromanage your team. So how do you get people to make good decisions? A lot of times they'll make decisions on what makes them feel better. Oh, I like to clear my email box or I like to get some certain type of thing done. Well, it may not be the key thing that is critical to advancing the mission of the company. There's many ways that you, you can, there's, oh, how many time management books if we are there out there and prioritization schemes. But all of you are smart enough and think of problems from a technical perspective. So I would say, why don't you view this as a complex system? View your business as a complex system, not just the technology, but the full business as the system. So I was trained as an aerospace engineer, and I don't think I, anybody can ever extract that type of thinking. As an aerospace engineer, we start with the answer. We start with the, let's say, the astronauts back in the ocean. <laughs> and then you work backwards, you take them back to the moon, and then from the moon back to the earth. So you solve the problem backwards because you have to have astronauts safe in the ocean or maybe safe on the landing strip. So when you're starting with the answer and then you're kind of starting to work back, that actually allows you to see some priorities in a different light. You may also want to look at variance analysis. If I don't do this, what happens? Is this, you know, is this a something in a trunk? Is this something in a numerical series that's a tertiary term that needs to be truncated because it just doesn't matter? Um, Ronya Kosmetsky, the wife of George Kosmetsky, wrote a book, Woman in Business. She had 10 rules at the back, wonderful. Rule number seven was ignore more <laughs> because the amount of things that are gonna be on your desk pushing you to go forward are gonna be distracting and your success and failure is gonna be determined on what you pick to do. And if you remain isolated, you're going to have a very myopic or very focused view. So therefore you wanna get out and talk to others. So. Um, and that's just really kind of what I wanted to reemphasize there. And it's, I think you pick and find mentors via networking, but networking isn't finding a mentor. Usually a mentor is kind of a life on life experience um, where you're meeting and discussing various things. And one thing good about a good mentor is they're trying to make sure you're successful. They're not just giving random advice. They're saying, I'm going to help you be successful. So a couple of um, things, this is kind of a cheesy slide. Everybody knows about that. But I want to add something to what we now do or I now do in an interview process. Um, and it kind of has this type of paradigm. Asking an employee, when they're done working at our company, what's your resume going to say to help you get the next job you want? Seems like an easy exercise. Just give me four or five bullet points on what you want your resume to say, your CV to say from this company, coming and doing this job, or you know, if you wanna say get promotions, put that in. Do that to help you get the next job. Well, that then makes them think, where do they want to go? What is the answer? Where do they want to take their career? So it's kind of like, okay, are we in this together? Are you wanting to get out of this, the necessary items to be a CEO the next time? That's great. You wanting to have a successful technology commercialization that you're a founding CTO at the next company? Perfect. But the key is if we can get you or the prospective employee to kind of share that, we can help them along that journey. And by helping them along that journey, they're helping us, but we're also helping their career. 
but they have to kind of understand where their career is headed. So when you start hanging around with your mentor or somebody you're mentoring, that may be great to ask them. What's your CV in the future, okay? You can write your CV now. What's that next opportunity and what do you need to accomplish to then be qualified for that next job? And then see if you can remain focused on that so that you can because the tyranny of the urgent can kill us. So what am I doing now? All kinds of fun things and I'll end up, I think I've gone over and, and um, uh, my time, so I'll kind of um, wind up with, with something fun. Uh, our company, Art Analysis and Research, uses technical imaging, material science, technical art history to examine works of art, uh, determine attribution, who did it, whether it's authentic, fake, uh, we date the, the work. So there's one example here. Um, that um, there was a uh, owner that had bought um, what they thought was a Kadinsky, um, brought it to the Kadinsky Foundation. They said, no, no, doesn't have what's needed there. So, but they then got, brought it to us and we used some technical imaging. And what we found under the portrait of this lady was an underdrawing. And uh, the, our, uh, leader in uh, London, she printed it out, she kind of sketched it, and wow, here's a harborscape, and we put that in the report. They then took it to the Kandinsky Foundation, where they found in the authenticated sketchbook of the artist that same sketch. So here we were able to tell these people, hey, look, the foundation has a matching sketch, they're going to authenticate it, and there was a lot of zeros added to the value of that painting. So it's um, a lot of fun. Uh, we get to see a lot of good works. We see a lot of bad works. Um, but a lot of fun really interrogating and examining history. Uh, unfortunately, we have to give bad news, and sometimes people just really don't want to hear the bad news that they have a fake, but that's just part of the deal. Um, so anyway, since I've, um, uh, this just is kind of a picture of us doing some of the imaging. This is in our New York office. Um, uh, Nika Gutman Rieppe leads that office. The lady I told you about leading our London office, Jolene Nadalny. Um, they do some stellar work there. And this uh, imaging here was done by Stephen Hanley, who just had a wonderful new daughter. So we're all kind of celebrating around the office uh, with that. But so with that, Alex, I'll just uh, hand it back over to you um, and see where you want to go from here. Thanks very much, Kurt. Uh, we've received a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, when did you actually discover that tech transfer was the right thing to do for you? <laughs> uh, I don't know that it was uh, discovery. Uh, uh, like the first launch of the company was uh, really under the auspices of George Kosmetsky. And by then I got embedded into the University of Texas. Uh, he was dean of the business school there and at IC squared. So. I got to, and then being an engineering graduate student there, I got to know a lot of people and there, that's when you kind of learned there was a lot of technology at that time setting around. So there was just a lot of opportunity. So it was just like sitting there at IST. It's something there, something available. You've got a network and you can actually go through and make the assessment of the technologies. But it's a hard road for sure because it's both an entrepreneurial road as well as you know transferring and commercializing technology um, but boy is it um, uh, rewarding when you um, get something that the market wants that you get the response you see the hard work of the researchers actually paying off that's that's a the reward is certainly um, compelling to to start that, but I really didn't say I was moving in technology commercialization. Just the first couple of um, 
ventures I did, I guess I just got hooked on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question centers around a very uh, fundamental problem, central problem actually in commercialization of technology. And it is uh, how to see the often non-obvious future applications of a new technology. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, that's um, uh, so I'll, let me kind of break that down. A lot of times the technology is a platform technology. Let's just use that as an example to where it can do many things. Um, and what do you pick um, for that? And um, that's uh, <laughs> Because to get an investment, you have to have a specific use of the platform that would go to the market. But the platform can be much more uh, for that. Uh, an example of that, the future use of the technology was, this was a protein that act, acted in the oxidative stress pathway. And if you inhibited this protein, you could improve radiation therapy. Um, and so in the running the control group, um, when we would did a knockdown uh, in the mice, when we were in the control group, we actually said when we gave more of the protein back, it actually pr had a protective effect. So that ended up being the best commercialization path forward. Well, one thing we didn't realize at the time was if when you knock down this protein, it was associated with P51, other cancer um, causing effects. And that was something totally different. And it's, that's being pursued by a, now a separate company licensed from the original one. So there was no guess that that could have happened. <laughs> and I would say, make sure you post short-term victories rather than saying the holy grail out there. You want to give that vision of potential applications. I think you want to have as much uh, license rights as you can for the technology. Uh, because uh, as I kind of talked about, the contracts are kind of the lifeblood. The key in a, li in a licensing agreement is you've got to be able to raise money and show that you have access and can protect the technology. You don't necessarily have to have everything to do that, and you may have it constrained. So I don't think you have to license everything to make sure you have everything, because there's plenty of times that you can relicense, you have an idea to reuse, you can do that. So I wouldn't get hung up to define all the use cases out there because when you come up with that, usually you have cooperative people on all sides of the table to help you get it to the market. I don't know if that answered this question specifically, but that was one example we had. And then another example that when we dealt with the tech commercialization office. We have received two questions that relate to the investor's role. The first one is a, is a maybe difficult one. How do you manage <laughs> investors when they have hidden agendas that actually pull you away from your original vision of a product or company? I would ask why they're pulling you away is the first thing. Um, uh, are, is, is your vision require too much cash? Does your vision require uh, advancing the uh, the field of science rather than the commercialization? Uh, would Is your ad, advancing for your vision something that the market, you think the market needs rather than what they want? So the first thing I would do would be ask why somebody's pulling you this way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've usually an investor is not going is going to be technology agnostic in regards to the vision of the technology. He's going to be focused on shareholder value. Um, and I think that's the discussion to have is why he's doing that and try to see what's his motivation and try to listen from that perspective. 
if he has a valid story, then I think you can listen and then you can talk about the pros and cons. But to latch on to an initial vision of a technology and carry that over to the commercialization is really tough. Just like I'd, um, we, we started with a commercialization plan of a protein, as I said, to knock down and improve radiation therapy. It then trained, changed into a radiation countermeasure with then finding other use as adjuvant therapies for cancer. Nothing about the original vision really survived once we got everybody on the same page and started looking at commercial value. So uh, you may have to run, go through the process with the investor uh, from that perspective. Um, but I, I would say probably there's a good middle ground because I don't know that any plan, commercialization plan coming out of the university really survives engagement with the market. I've never seen one fully survive. Mm -hmm. um, you showed the slide with the value valuation chumps. The question relates to what were your biggest surprises related to that in the terms of how high the chump was or what actually cost the chump? Initially, as I was learning, it's what caused the jump. Because as you can see, I put the chart up here, it's not value creating events, it's de-risking events. You know, uh, and when you look at de-risking, there is, okay, um, and it's not always around the technology. Do you have customer traction is usually, is usually one. Um, there is technology risk. There's also management risk. Who do you have on your team? Oh, you need to go get this other person to de-risk it. So if you kind of go through kind of the risk elements, there's the financial risk, there's the market risk, the management team risk, the technology risk, the actual product risk. So there's a lot of the standard categories that have variations, but to see that there was some things you just needed to go do that was outside the technology development path that de-risked the company to increase the value, that was the biggest paradigm shift that I had. Um, another one that we get a lot is a scalable business model. It's like, okay, you hit that inflection point and the company is going to grow. Is your model, the way you do business, can it actually scale? When you show the increase in revenue, the increase in production, can you actually do that at that scale and at that price and show me how? So, and a lot of it didn't have to do with the technology because the technology has a lot of research behind it. It has a lot of credible scientists, engineers behind it. And usually it's the other things where I kind of said, view the whole thing as a system and solve the system problem, not just the technology problem. Mm -hmm. For one of the listeners, it was a surprise that you put so much emphasis on communication. And the question is actually, are there special models of communication that you found especially useful or maybe also ineffective for certain kind of audience or um, situations? Yes, um, I think, and it's usually unique, like anything, it's very unique. Um, it depends on how people usually handle negative information. There's a great um, book on how people handle negative information uh, and how different cultures handle negative information and how they convey. I'm sure you know, we've had some wonderful interactions with um, uh, our Dutch friends who are very quick to point out any thing that I've done wrong, but they do it helping me. <laughs> but that communication style of communicating negative information really doesn't necessarily work in an indirect communication culture such as the UK. So I think you first have to understand what's the culture or the background of the person receiving the information. Um, also, um, there's the uh, sometimes a strong feeling that somebody doesn't want to necessarily be wrong. Okay, nobody likes being wrong, 
Other people handle that negative information and take it forward. Some people really just want to make sure that you understand why they did what they did because it wasn't really wrong. So I would say how you handle pushback, how you handle conveying negative information is part of the key model and how those people receive it because you can crush things by delivering it incorrectly. And that's why I've kind of emphasized communication. And this has just my, been my experience that if we could increase communication, increase empathy, I think we'd just be much more productive and understanding and having a lot less stress and disagreement. Mm -hmm. We received another very relevant question, and that is, if you're an ex a technology expert, what are the other core skills that you need in the team? And how do you decide at the end whether you should acquire those skills by yourself uh, rather than out licensing it to somebody or actually bringing somebody in who brings those skills? Ah, okay. that's a great question. Um, for the transition to, to business, I kind of alluded to it. If you're, let's just say you're the CTO, but also have management over the development program. I would say the first thing you want to do is be able to show a Gantt chart. You know, what, when, what are the target dates? Because everything's going to be running around a cash burn. When do we run out? When's our valuation going to increase? When can we show, then go out and raise other money? It's all around time and all around delivery. So the first thing I would say is make sure, whether you wanna do a CPM critical path method, Gantt charts send, send to, tend to be easiest. Um, I would also make sure you communicate to the team the priorities. What is the critical path? What is dependencies? So that they can make the, their independent decisions of investment and time to contribute to the project. So communication of clarity of objectives, missions, time frame, expectations, I think is critical. But the Gantt chart usually is where you start that discussion. Um, in terms of outsourcing, uh, it really depends on if it's gonna be a key core element of your business. If it's core intellectual property, you want to hire people to build that. If it's just something to outsource, like a manufacturing and build something, outsource it so that you don't have to, so that you can control it and have a, a tighter reign. It's not usually done under a contract with more specificity. And that way you don't increase your burn rate inside the company unduly to where if when things get delayed, as they always seem to happen, um, then I think that's what you want to, to do, um, how you wanna make the outsourcing decision. If it's key critical to the foundational elements of the company, you wanna build the team around that. If it's something, a one-time thing, or where there's uh, expertise that doesn't add to the value of your company, outsource it. Um, from that perspective. Also, from a technical perspective, I would say you want to have a strong and rigid product management paradigm. Product management means stop feature creep. Let's say you've got version 1.0 you're developing. People are going to have all kinds of ideas of how to change it and add to it. Great, let's put that in version 2. Oh, wonderful, let's put that in version 5. Well, that's kind of a crazy idea. That's in version 23. So uh, I would say you want to guard the specifications and what's in that and only make changes that you kind of understand the impact of those changes. All right, Kurt, thank you very much for sharing your perspectives. Um, there is two more questions I think that we need to come to a close. Um, <laughs> with a revolutionary new technology in your hands, is it wise to also start with a revolutionary business model? <laughs> yes, I don't know. It's, um, it's a risk. Um, 
a lot of times you're when you're saying something like that it's almost like we're having to create a market and so we're having a very new technology but it's going to take a new business paradigm to do it that could be what you'd call a unicorn the billion dollar company it could be the facebook the twitter the things like that maybe not so much that just as you would say, multiplies either the, the risk or multiplies the probability of success. And when you multiply something less than one, it reduces it. Um, so the probability of success, I think, would go down. But is it worth then the opportunity of the increased um, uh, activity uh, or the increased value that you might create? One thing that I've gone to this, I've stopped going to this certain type of conference is there is a lot of technology people at this conference saying how the market needed to change. And that was the voice of the conference, the market needed to change. And when you kind of step back and looked at the conference, these people were all kind of saying that the market needed to change so their business could be successful. <laughs> so I think if you're looking at a revolutionary business model, what's gonna motivate the uptake of that business model? Does the market have to change? And if it does, does it want to change? What motivates the market to change? That I think would be the crux and the insight that you would have to make that decision. Good. So, Good. Thanks again. I, I guess if I if I look back uh, to the last 60 minutes, I have a couple of takeaways, but at least two I'd like to speak out. And one is the ignore more. I think that is a very, <laughs> very compelling thing to remember. Uh, prioritization, ignore more. That's that's important. We are very bad in that as human beings in general. And the second one is the uh, getting rid of the expectation of a linear path to success and actually expect the unexpected and many pivots on the way to success. And maybe let's Indeed. <laughs> the rhetoric question. Did you ever re, um, um, uh, no, now that the word is slipping my mind, uh, re, did you ever regret to choose a role in technology transfer? Uh, probably only twice every day. <laughs> <laughs> that was a different answer than I expected, but <laughs> no, it, doesn't, so, it doesn't end with that. <laughs> no, no, it, there, there are, because you're bringing something, you know, you, because you have these different, as the CEO, you have the different, you have the investors here and you have the science here and you have the market and customer here you're at the crux in the middle of that. Um, so a lot of times you're brokering the communication aspect of it. And just like the one good question, hey, I've got an investor that's crushing the vision of my thing. As the CEO, that's my problem then to solve. So, um, so I was really making a joke on, on regretting it. The, the satisfaction is great to see basic research that we put lots of our society's money in to coming and helping solve a lot of the society problems. And a lot of people view business as, oh, it's commercial, it's evil. Well, it's the way we get things into the marketplace and into people's hands. So I applaud what IST is doing to bring those together. Um, and help get the technology out there. Um, I don't know that I'd wanna do anything else. I've now seek those opportunities out uh, because it's just so fun dealing with wonderfully smart people in uh, science and technology to see what their work and really dedic life dedication can actually do um, to help the, on the business side, which is how we translate to society. With that, I'd like to thank you again, Kurt, for your words, for your uh, experience and your stories today. Thanks for your attendance, everybody, to 
Um, today's twist talk, there will be more coming upcoming depending on the situation will continue online or again in physical meetings uh, at IST. I wish you all a nice remaining day and look forward to meeting you online or physically again at another occasion. Thank you very much. Bye everyone.